I was downtown and stuff that they would they would frequent, but drinking would be a, a frequent occupation. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I should also mention that John Harris, one of the things that he uh, did, um, and I didn't realize this until recently, but he uh, was one of the founders of the um, Mechanics Institute in London. And one of the express purposes of that, I don't know how successful it was, was to try and get people who otherwise would while away their time drinking, that was almost explicitly stated in that kind of way, to be able to spend their time at a library improving themselves, listening to lectures and things like that. So that kind of activity came along, but um, for better or for worse, it was often more availed by the upper classes than the lower classes at the end of the day. But ideally, that, that would have been another occupation available to them. So I just want to be, um, when you're mentioning the productions they put on, it sounds like it's all amazing. Now they're around music. Did they do Shakespeare or anything like that? There's no record of them doing Shakespeare. Uh, Amelia Harris used to read Shakespeare to her daughters. Um, there are a couple of references to that in the Elden House Diaries, and there's also a reference to Gilbert Griffin doing a reading of Shakespeare at the Mechanics Institute. So that, that's the early references to Shakespeare that I've been able to turn up. And there is a, uh, a volume of Shakespeare in the Elden House Library. Uh, I don't actually know. Um, I know that they saw, it's, I mean, the first Royal Scots were a very, very long uh, lived regiment. They only were disbanded in the last 20 years, something like that. Um, so they, they engaged in battles throughout the 20th century, um, as well as the 19th and 18th um, century. Certainly they saw action in, in the War of 1812. Um, but locally, did this garrison engage in battles? No. Not at all. This is one of the fun pieces of it. They anticipated engaging in battles. There, there's a there's a diary entry from the very first year that there was a militia here, where they kept hearing rumors about going to Amherstburg, but they were never actually called to go there. And so their entire time here was basically spent in all of these leisure activities. And really, we benefited from that enormously, um, as well as benefiting from it economically, because by the time they left, it was a city of 10,000 people instead of 1,000 people. And principally that was because they had these big orders for you know, leather, for food, for um, all of the kinds of things that only uh, a more sizable town could provide. So I, that's, that's why I say this is sort of a swords to plowshare story, because they didn't do any fighting at all, they didn't put down any rebels, um, you know, they put on plays instead. How long were they there? Um, until 1854-55, roughly. Um, uh, in 1839, 1838, 1839. Do you remember the start of the Crimean? Mm -hmm. They left the, around the time that the battle was started. Uh, I don't know. Does somebody else have any other right? That's about right, yeah. Yeah. Before 1858. Yeah. Roger. Well, where is Wolves of Barracks fit into that? Would that have been put up later, or would that have been in? Oh, yes, quite a bit later. Um, yeah, that's. You mentioned like there was a building called the Theater Royal, mm -hmm. and was that financed and built by the military or by the people in town? By the military. Oh, okay. And this is this is why it, it sort of works to think of it as uh, you know an infrastructural gift to the people of the community because it was it wasn't very long in 1844 mm -hmm. that the community started actually putting on plays as local amateurs in that theater. But it was really having a, theater, a theatrical space already built for them that enabled that. Uh, they tried to get a grant of land from Colonel Talbot to just get it given to them free outright. Uh, and uh, Colonel Talbot certainly did that, um, more or less basically just erase somebody else's name and put their name, this theater royal, on, on his land granting map. But this was termed illegal when it actually went upstairs. And so they, had to, they ended up having to buy it outright for, I think, 10 pounds. But yeah, that would have been. In the military's purview, and in fact, it was um, there. There was uh, a commissariat officer named Thomas Rayner, who the land that the theater was on um, it ended up in his possession. And until 1855, um, it was 
uh, it was noted as his possession, basically. So it's possible he might have even put up the ten dollars, the ten pounds, um, which was about an evening's proceeds. So not very expensive when it comes down to it. How much of uh, your research is for materials found on, online, and how much is you know your spent time in the archives? And Vastly more time in the archives. Uh, they, I mean, we're very lucky that more and more of this stuff is, is coming to be available online, but um, yeah, most of this is not. And part of the project of Garrison Theatricals is trying to make more of this stuff available online, both trying to provide more pointers to what is available in the National Archives. So, you know, if you wanted to go, uh, we're, you know, setting up resources so that you'd be able to go, oh, here is the stuff that you can find about London, Ontario as a finding aid. Um, but but much of it is still only in paper form, um, and, and you know uh, it takes takes a lot of digging through dusty paper. Do you know if how that was uh, like how this kind of cultural Absolutely. In fact, there are some marvelous um, paintings of the theater actually being staged on the Garrison Theater stage in Halifax. Um, which I can sort of show you off later, online later, but there's, there, are, there are a number of those. It's really quite exciting. So how early would that have started? I don't know. Because that would have been, um, if I want that's a town, Oh, yeah. I, I assume that they had they had uh, theatricals like this uh, 50 years before we do, but I, do, I don't know. It's a very speculative question, mm -hmm. but do, do you think there could be a connection between this early theater development there might be a connection. I don't I don't I think that the historical record is too tenuous to really nail that down at the moment. One of the things that I'm trying to do right now is examine very closely the birth of amateur theater in eighteen forty three. Ontario. So that move from 1843 to 1844, you've got military theater one year, and then the officers of the first royals and the third, who were really the theatrical powerhouses in town, move away, um, and um, you know suddenly the gentlemen amateurs take their place. And so that that it's moment of transition is very interesting. Uh, uh, and London was certainly a big, the seed. yeah, it planted the seed, and, and London became a very theatrically active city in London, Ontario. So much so that by the time the officers came back to su suppress the Fenians, which again they mostly weren't required to do, um, uh, they put on theatricals again, but they weren't that kind of center of cultural activity anymore because there was so much amateur activity um, and professional activity, in fact, that outshone what the officers were able to do, you know, later on. Would they have had theatricals uh, as part of the Elton House? Social life, as for instance, after supper, would they have sometimes had a theater at night? And would it have been considered proper mm -hmm. for the Harris daughters to assume roles? And if they could assume roles in the home, could they do it in a garrison theater, or could the men always do that? Well, it's funny you happen to ask that. Um, uh, as I say, Amelia Harris would read Shakespeare to her daughters, so we do have evidence for that. Uh, in the 1870s, Sophia, I think, would um, stage music palette, I think how they were pronounced, um, which uh, Amelia described as relatively timid affairs. But she was able to attract upwards of 100 people for one of them. Um, so they're, they're theatrical-like entertainments at Elden House. We don't have any evidence that you know things like um, the daughters getting, you know, sitting around to read uh, was um, part of the Elden House milieu, but it's indeed plausible. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're planning right now is to explore what uh, such a reading might have looked like with the Paris daughters and with some of the officers. Uh, that's London Assurance is a perfect kind of drawing room comedy for that, that exploration. Great. And that's sort of part we have an example of the young people getting together to put on a theatrical performance. And I wonder if that's, you know, maybe a common thing. Like maybe they did do that kind of thing for their own amusement. 
I have no evidence for it in London, Ontario. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, they did lots of other things both in the house and in the grounds for their own amusements. They very often did mixed parties. So you had mixed parties going out on sleighing trips. You had mixed parties um, playing uh, croquet. You had uh, you know mixed parties going to the beach, this kind of thing. So I don't see any reason why you wouldn't have that for theater. Uh, I mean, there might be, you know, people who would thunder on from the pulpit about the, um, you know, all of the scurrilousness that was likely to come from this. Uh, uh, certainly after a prominent ball at the Goodhues, um, I think Benjamin Cronin um, mm -hmm. uh, preached a sermon against um, this sort of thing the day afterwards, very pointedly. Uh, so, and, and that kind of thing often happened in other places like Halifax for theater. And the, the dodge for this, which you usually did, is you, you, you had charity performances. So, so you might say the proceeds of this evening's performance are going to go to the victims of the fire in 1844, uh, or to go to some uh, people overseas that, that, that very badly needed help. And so there were attempts to legitimize the theater both by making charitable endeavors, but also by having them always um, being under the patronage of the presiding officer of the regiment. So it had all of the appearance of officialdom. And when the amateur actors came to London, you notice they called themselves the gentleman amateurs. And they were all the leading men of the town. Um, you know, the uh, Shanley and H.C.R. Beecher and James Hamilton, uh, you know, these were the bankers, the lawyers, and so they had to position themselves as gentlemen first, um, mm -hmm. and that this was a legitimate activity for gentlemen to be undertaking. Mark, Great. Well, if there are no other questions, well, yes. I have one. Oh, oh absolutely. I, I'm curious whether um, the theater in London was mm -hmm. to relieve some of the boredom, uh, as you implied, but was it common in England as well in the time of Jane Austen, where the officers? Doing theatricals there? I don't know whether they were doing them in England, but they were doing them in India, for instance. India. I, mean, I think okay. in Australia as well. So, so there, there was really garrison. They were doing them in the Canadian Arctic. Um, so anywhere where you had officers and boredom <laughs> in the same place, theatricals emerged. And so something I'm really curious about is to find a little bit more. I, I mean, obviously garrison theatricals weren't as well received in India because it was really this kind of perceived as this kind of like colonialist, um, you know, imposition, essentially. Uh, so th there, there, there's different perceptions depending on where you go. But clearly an awful lot of the stuff was actually going on. So it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface of that. Yes? I live on the Longwoods Road, just almost adjacent to the site of the Battle of the Longwoods. Now mm -hmm. the world, Scots Regiment, fought there. Aha. They were stationed in Delaware. Do you know anything about how they... Was there a garrison in Delaware? Or? I've never, I, I, I'll just say I don't know. I've never heard of one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that's, that just period is before my sort of area of confidence. Yeah. So um, I, if anybody else has the answer to that question, uh, that'd be great. But I, I could be willing to pronounce on that. Do you right. know anything about how the theater was organized as far as the viewing audience, for instance, um, with the Harris family have a box where they that organized? Uh, there were boxes, and there were certain, there was actually a scandal to do with that kind of organization. Uh, Colonel Weatherall was accused in the local paper of being admitted to the theater first so that he could get preferential treatment as far as the seats that he had. Um, and uh, the garrison had to do a lot of backpedaling on this, but it it did seem like there was uh, a side door that officers could admit their favorites to prior to the performance. And Mrs. Ann Port talks about being admitted um, uh, sort of by a dark door on North Street in advance of the performance. Um, so probably something like that was going on. Uh, they gave cops to the Harrises, um, so, which was you know, a good idea. You want sort of the first family in London to be coming to your performances because it's another way of legitimizing them. And so um, this seemed to be a kind of routine thing that they would give free tickets to the Harrises. Uh, but there were certainly, there were certainly boxes, um, which were um, essentially 50 cents, and then the pit was 25 cents. 
Um, this theater could seat about 200 people. 